Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm your host, Blake Johnson. In this week's episode, we're going to be joined by PPC regular Teresa Cardinal Brown with a closer look at the US Mexico bilateral relationship and its impact on immigration and border policy. The two countries recently held a series of high level bilateral government meetings and announced a new framework for cooperation. Then, we feature an extended segment of The Gavel, where we will discuss the recent litigation and case developments surrounding the Migrant Protection Protocols, the Title 42 order, and Mexico's role in both of those policies. Finally, we'll close out this episode by covering the new ICE Enforcement Priorities Memo. All of this to come, so stick around. Last week, we received news that delegations from the United States and Mexico met in Mexico City to lay out plans for a new bilateral security framework. This was meant to overhaul the previous Merida initiative. According to officials in the Biden administration, the new Bicentennial Agreement will prioritize a humane approach to migration management and would allow for both countries to set joint enforcement priorities. The two administrations also signaled that the new partnership would allow the countries to work together to deter crime, human trafficking, and the smuggling of illegal narcotics, though many suggested that both of the countries largely sidestepped a deeper conversation about the shared border and the growing migration crisis. To discuss the history of the U.S.-Mexico border cooperation and what the new deal might entail, let's bring in BPC Managing Director for Immigration and Cross-Border Policy, Teresa Cardinal Brown, whom you can follow at Twitter on Twitter at BPC underscore T Brown. Hey, Teresa, how are you? I'm doing well, Blake. Nice to be here. Great. Well, let's jump right in. Uh, you know, there's a lot to unpack here, and we we're hoping that you could help us get a little bit of history of how these security negotiations came about. What was the Merida Initiative, and why are these countries feel the need to do something new? Sure. So a, a couple of things to understand. Um, obviously, the United States and Mexico have a, had a long history of bilateral interactions. But the Merida Initiative was sort of a restart to those um, relationships during the administration of George W. Bush. So uh, when George W. Bush entered office in 2000, uh, Vicente Fox was president of Mexico. But during his second term, Felipe Calderon became president. And the two of them wanted to sort of reset U.S.-Mexico relations, which had been, I'd say, for much of our history, a little bit fraught. Mexico had seen the United States as sort of its uh, big neighbor to the north and was always um, insistent that it, it, it maintain its own sovereignty. So Mexico was highly resistant to deep levels of bilateral cooperation, fearing that the United States as the, the larger economy, the bigger country would sort of dictate to Mexico how it should run. But under the Merida initiative, the idea was that countries would work together. And this was during a time when uh, drug cartel violence in Mexico was really, really high. And in part, President Calderon was uh, elected to uh, fight those drug cartels. And he asked for the first time for U.S. assistance to do so. And that's how the Merida Initiative was, was formed. Um, a lot of people at the time nicknamed it Plan Mexico, who compared it to Plan Colombia, which was the United States plan in the 80s to help Colombia with its security issues around drug production and cartels. But the focus of the Merida Initiative was also on counter-narcotics, border security, counterterrorism, public security, but also institution development. And a lot of the effort under that initiative was put into developing relationships between the United States and Mexican law enforcement agencies, developing what are called vetted units, where uh, basically the United States ensures that the people on the Mexican side they're dealing with are not going to be linked to the cartels because there's a lot of corruption there. It also involves some military cooperation in security and counter drug efforts. So under President Obama, the initiative evolved a little bit. Um, it added the development of a 21st century border idea, uh, cooperation on managing the border securely in both directions, rule of law, human rights promotion, addressing root causes of poverty and violence. But still, the core of it was really about combating tr transnational criminal organizations and drug smuggling. Now, when President Trump came into office, he 
you know, didn't really work under the framework of the Merida Initiative per se. We all remember that he forced a renegotiation of NAFTA. Um, he threatened Mexico with tariffs to get it to engage more in stopping undocumented migration to the U.S.-Mexico border. But he also uh, wanted them to focus a lot on port security and combating money laundering. During the Trump administration, however, there was a, a, a fracture, if you will, in the U.S. and Mexico law enforcement relationship. The United States arrested a former Mexican defense minister, Salvador Sintuegos, on drug charges. And this heavily angered the Mexican government of President Andres Manuel López Obrador, or AMLO. He insisted that the United States drop the charges. Uh, there were uh, they they sent out of the country many uh, U.S. law enforcement officials in in protest of this action. Eventually, the United States did drop the charges. AMLO ended up, you know, uh, not not necessarily pardoning him, but but relieving him of any any charges. And then subsequently, the Mexican Congress, in retaliation, enacted a law that required all foreign law enforcement officials to share all of the information they gathered with Mexican officials and that all state and local officials had to report the contacts with foreign law enforcement officials to the federal government. Well, this impacted a lot of the U.S.-Mexico bilateral law enforcement cooperation, and it's still a, an issue of friction. There, I think that after all of this, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mexican Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard announced that Merida was dead. Uh, that that framework that relied heavily on this law enforcement cooperation that was so focused on getting drug lords and and rooting out cartels was was no longer valid. And so the meeting last week in Mexico City was to try to see if they could come up with a new framework for how the United States and Mexico would work on whatever joint issues they wanted to. So that's where this bicentennial agreement came up. It, it's called the bicentennial agreement because it is is. This year is the 200th anniversary of Mexican independence and therefore the bilateral independent relationship between Mexico and the United States. And so that's one of the reasons it, it's it's called it's being called the Bicentennial Agreement. So uh, this new uh, Bicentennial Agreement, you know, is this sort of like trying to just restart what they had and maybe put a nicer shine to it? Or, or what's what's different within this framework than what we had in the past? Well, if you listen to the Mexican government authorities, they say that the difference is that they feel that for the first time, the United States and Mexico are acting as equals in this relationship. Now, whether or not that's true empirically or not is hard to say, but at least according to the current Mexican administration, that this agreement is based on an agreed upon set of goals that they both want to get to. It does include public safety and some renewal and redefining of the law enforcement cooperation relationship. A lot of it is focused on development and assistance, not just in Mexico, but in Central America. And that's the primary way in which they want to address migration. They, they are talking about public health cooperation, but a lot of it is at this point still very high level. We don't have a lot of details on exactly what this is going to be. What they have said is that by December 1st of this year, the countries will come up with essentially a plan of action, concrete steps they want to take under these pillars through the next year. And then in, by January 2022, they want to have another three-year plan on what to move forward. So it is worth noting that the Mexican president is in the middle of his presidential term. Presidential terms in Mexico are six years. So in another three years, he will be up for election, re-election. Uh, I'm sorry, he won't be up for re-election because in Mexico, they only won't serve one term. So there might be a new president. But that's the term that they have right now so that they'll see how far this goes. So, you know, on that, with just within the framework, obviously, you know, we don't have details yet. But how, how do you think this is looking for, you know, some of the border policies that we're dealing with, such as the migrant protection protocols and Title 42? Well, that's very interesting, because during the press conference uh, of the of uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and the Foreign Minister of Mexico, uh, Marcelo Abrad, 
many of the questions from the reporters were about, what did you talk about migration? What about the border? And they were very, very insistent that they didn't really talk about the border. They definitely didn't talk about Title 42 or MPP or any of the particular border policies. They insisted that those conversations are happening separately and happening on a daily basis, but that this was much more about a broader overall framework for U.S. and Mexico cooperation on these bigger issues. I think that that's a bit of a disappointment to certainly the members of the press who asked the questions, but considering how much of a focal point the border is right now, certainly for the Biden administration, that it's under court order to restart MPP, which I think we'll talk about in a little while, and is relying on Mexico for Title 42, that absence in the center of a large meeting that include, included you know, that where the, the, the U.S. delegation met with the Mexican president directly. It included the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General. The fact that that wasn't brought up seems to be a, a huge absence in this in this agreement. Well, not just the issue, but the person who was absent from this was the vice president, who the president has tasked uh, his vice president, Kamal Harris, with dealing with these root causes and the border. Uh, is that playing sort of a politics game right now? Or is this just, you think this is maybe just the start of these negotiations to to get to the point where they end up uh, bringing her in later? Well, what the U.S. government said is that this meeting was a result of the meetings that the vice president had in Mexico earlier this year. That as a result of those meetings, this, uh, they called it the high-level security dialogue, as well as a high-level economic dialogue that happened earlier are sort of the outcomes of that high-level meeting. I will say one thing that uh, at least is ha- at least how they've spoken about this agreement, and we don't have any text. Uh, this is not something that is likely to be made public until everybody, all the uh, all the plans are out there. But the the one thing they did talk about with regard to migration was this idea of trying to work together to address the root causes, and this has been a hobby horse of the Mexican president for a while now. He, he started it with President Trump. He's been insisting with President Biden. They seem to have alignment there in that instead of focusing on interdiction and deterrence, the Mexican president really wants to focus on job development. He has a, a jobs program in Central America that he's asking basically the U.S. to fund. And President Biden has said he wanted, uh, he did ask Congress for $4 billion to go toward the Central American countries for root causes. But as we've said before on this uh, program, and as we're seeing now with the arrival of Haitians and Venezuelans and Ecuadorians and people from Africa and Asia, this is really now a hemispheric issue. And while focusing on the countries of Central America is going to be important, I think it's going to have to be a broader regional dialogue of how can we address migration that's happening throughout Latin America and the Caribbean right now, not just from Central America to the U.S. So so managing this, you know, this this migration issue, you know, what do you think that they should be prioritizing, in your opinion? Well, I don't think it's bad to prioritize the root causes and and job development and all those other things that that can help people feel like they have a choice to stay where they are or stay in the countries they're at rather than migrate north. But those are long term solutions. Uh, The immediacy of what needs to be happening at the border is a resolution to what happens with uh, MPP in Title 42. The Biden administration is on the hook for both of those right now. But furthermore, I think a resolution of how we share joint responsibility for managing the migration flows in the region. Is it just all about deterrence and border security and stopping people before they come? Or can we assist Mexico with uh, increasing their ability to provide protection and jobs for Haitians and other people that are coming up through Mexico? Can we work with Mexico to address the other countries in the hemisphere? Certainly, we have work to do on our own side in how we treat asylum seekers once they arrive, how we fix our asylum system, which is completely overwhelmed right now with the cases that have been coming in since you know mid 2010s now you know we have to figure out how we do that and i think that that requires some detailed conversations beyond just like the immediacy of will mexico take back more families under title 42 for example well it also sounds like you know we need to repair some relations here as you mentioned you know this the the whole agreement had originally been you know, you know, nixed by the Mexican government for the Biden administration to sort of like 
restructure this relationship and sort of bring it back in, into some good standing and find some common ground here. Um, you know, is that achievable? Can this help perhaps bring some stability to our issues here on the border? Like, what do you think is going to happen? And as you mentioned, you know, the MPP, these other things that the Biden administration is legally on the hook to to restart, um, but still needs the Mexican government's involvement. So this is where we have to kind of peek behind the curtain of the public press conferences and figure out what's really happening here. I think it's been clear for some time that the Mexican president wanted to have a conversation with the American administration that went beyond just the border. And so this effort really can kind of get to some of the priorities Mexico has, make sure the United States is paying attention to them. I think that's one of the reasons why Mexico was very insistent that Merida is not the framework we're going to work under anymore. We need to reset. We need to do something different. And why they are so enthusiastic about this, because they feel like they're more in the driver's seat, if you will. It also allows them to sort of leverage the fact that the U.S. really needs them on migration management right now to get some of these other things that they want, right? Like this is, they have more leverage than maybe they've had in the past in negotiations with the United States, certainly than the time when President Trump was threatening tariffs against them if they didn't lock down their borders, right? This is a different administration and different type of relationship. The other thing, again, to kind of peel back the curtain into how bureaucracies and foreign relations work. I mean, I was I, I was deeply involved in a lot of this when I was at the Department of Homeland Security under the Bush administration, and he had the, the Security and Prosperity Partnership, which was a set of agreements with Canada and Mexico that would cover everything from economic cooperation to law enforcement cooperation to development assistance to all kinds of things. And what these kind of framework agreements do is they create a structure under which the vast bureaucracies of both governments can plug in and say, aha, I see how the thing I'm working on plugs into this priority and gives it a higher level of oomph, if you will, in the bureaucracy of each country. It also can help create relationships between institutions that can productively work to achieve the goals. So having high level interest having a framework, the fact that they have, that they're putting together an actual action plan with deliverables, um, we'll have to see how concrete those are. But if those are really concrete deliverables, those are instructions to their governments, get on the stick, make this work for us, right? So it can really drive to results. And it also is an effective way of managing what, at least for the United States and Mexico, the United States and Canada, is a really complex and broad relationship. Being that we are physical neighbors sharing a border, there is almost nothing about the United States and what we do as a government or an economy that does not affect Mexico and vice versa. So it's not like our entire relationship is really about the border, although that seems to be the focus point, the nexus, if you will, of where all these other things happen. But we have broader interests. And this kind of a framework can really drive that. So if Mexico needed a reset, and the Merida initiative was over 20 years old, um, it's really rare that any sort of framework of this kind lasts that long uh, through several administrations in both countries. So it probably was an opportune time for a reset. You know, whether or not this will actually create differences or improve the relationship, if it will pay out dividends on the migration side, I think we have to kind of wait and see. But I do think that it's a necessary step. Certainly, AMLO and his administration were not really going to have constructive conversations about migration until they kind of had their other issues more predominantly addressed in the relationship. Well, look, Teresa, thanks for walking us through all that. And let's go ahead and look at to our next segments here. A lot has been going on in the litigation and immigration world, so it's once again time for a special segment of The Gavel. In this first section of The Gavel, which is a three-part series, so want to make sure we hit one, two, and three, <laughs> let's talk about what is going on with the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP. The Trump-era policy that was initially rescinded by the Biden administration, but has since then, through a federal court in Texas, been reinstituted and requires the administration to restart the program in good faith. An appeal of that decision failed to uh, find a stay, and now the Biden administration has indicated it will once again attempt to rescind the program while also trying to implement it 
as ordered by the court. So look, Teresa, let's bring you back in here. Uh, what is the Biden where where are they on restarting MPP? We talked about the relationship with Mexico here. You know, is it operational yet? It's not operational yet. We are told or we understand that the administration has actively sought contracts and places to reopen the courts that were along the border, the immigration courts along the border that process these MPP cases. I think they are looking at how they can do implement MPP in a little bit more humane manner. So they may be looking at putting together, for example, more discreet guidance to Border Patrol agents and CBP on which migrants would be put into MPP, where the exceptions might lie. You know, who might be accepted from that and, and allowed to stay in the country. So it's not operational yet. The Biden administration seems to be taking certain steps. I wouldn't say it's rushing, <laughs> um, but it is taking certain steps to try to put it in operation. Meanwhile, as you said, they, they issued a statement saying they intend to write another memo that would try to meet the court's requirements for ending the program. So we'll see how that goes. Well, you know, Many have suggested that, you know, really this all hinges on Mexico's willingness to cooperate, you know, which our courts can't exactly compel. Uh, right. You know, exactly. as we were just discussing, it seems like, you know, they haven't been substantively discussed uh, as part of these discussions here that, that they recently had. Um, you know, how does it impact the Biden administration's ability to comply with the judge's orders? Well, as you said, at the end of the day, if Mexico says, no, we won't let you send non-Mexican people back to our territory, we cannot implement MPP, full stop. So in that case, what the Biden administration would have to tell the court is, we are ready to utilize this, this policy, but Mexico is saying no, so we can't actually implement it. So we did what we could, basically, we did our best. You know, we don't know exactly what conversations are happening between the United States and Mexico and MPP. They apparently didn't happen in this high level security dialogue, but that doesn't mean they're not happening. As a matter of fact, they, Marcelo Ebrard kind of indicated that he talks pretty much daily to Alejandro Mayorkas about the border. So they may be having conversations, but to date, we don't know that there is any sort of agreed upon mechanism or whom the Mexican government will agree to take back. What we can infer we can infer where they're at by the, who they're taking back under Title 42. So Mexico, over the last many months, has declined to take back an increasing number of families, uh, particularly families with younger children, under Title 42. So it's reasonable to assume that Mexico would not be that eager to take them back under NPP either. So that And right now, that is a significant proportion of the encounters that are happening at the U.S.-Mexico border. So... Again, whether or not that Mexico cooperates in taking them back could really mean whether or not a revived MPP would be that effective. If we look at the numbers right now, a majority of families encountered at the border are not being sent back to Mexico under Title 42 or MPP or anything else. They are eventually being released in the United States with a notice to report or a notice to appear. And so, you know, that situation is one that the Biden administration is trying to figure out how to alleviate you know, they, they don't like the idea that so many people are still trying to come to the United States, uh, particularly, you know, en masse, such as we saw from the Haitians. And so this is sort of the crux and the sticking point of this particular matter. Well, and, you know, just to close this up, you know, they said that they're looking to issue a new order to try to end the program. Do you think it'll be successful? Is it just a matter of like going through the right processes? What issues do they have to address? Yeah, according to the judge in Texas, uh, his reasoning was similar to the reasoning in, uh, you know, that the Supreme Court had in other cases that they didn't consider alternatives to just ending MPP, that they didn't do it through a proper notice and comment, although the original program, I don't think even had an actual memo, it was just sort of a policy that started or a program that started on its own. So, uh, there's some sort of formality that has to go into meeting what the judge says is due consideration to all of the impacts of all of the stakeholders of not doing MPP or doing MPP. In this case, the stakeholders are the states that sued, especially Texas, but other states that sued and said the ending of MPP, the arrival of the additional migrants has created substantial hardships on their states. So that's really the, the interest and consideration that this judge apparently is focusing on. Now, we did note that the Biden administration appealed to the, the Fifth Circuit uh, of Appeal, Court of Appeals 
in Texas to get a stay of the Texas judge's order. The appeals court denied the stay, so they have to continue to try to put MPP in place. But they are still in, still looking to appeal the decision of the judge, right? So there's still ongoing litigation in this case. So at the same time, they are trying to comply with a lower court order to reinstate MPP, appealing that order to the appellate court, and looking to issue a memo that would meet the lower court standard for ending MPP. So they're basically trying everything they can at this minute to try and deal with all three of them. Well, we'll keep tabs on that and we'll keep hopping through the gavel here and go into our next courtroom. Uh, Next, we turn to the latest court developments on Title 42, the public health order used by both the Trump and Biden administrations to send hundreds of thousands of migrants home from the border. And it's also drawing increasingly strident opposition from human rights and asylum advocates. Recently, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas told the news agency that it was heartbreaking to see asylum seekers being turned away, yet continue to insist that Title 42 is not an immigration policy, but a public health policy. More recently, some administration officials have resigned in protest of the use of this order to deport Haitian asylum seekers back to Haiti, with one calling it, quote, illegal and another, quote, inhumane. Teresa, why do you think the administration that ran on a humane immigration policy platform seems bent on fighting to keep such an increasingly unpopular policy alive, especially amidst such backlash? Well, I think much like MPP, right, uh, the administration closed down MPP, citing that it wasn't a humane program and was sued by Republican governors to reinstate it. I, you know, they're they're continuing to fight a lawsuit brought by the ACLU and immigration advocates against the Trump administration's use of Title 42. But at the same time, they're implementing it at the border. I have to say that I find this 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 line of Alejandro Mayorkas, and he's repeated a few times now that Title 42 isn't an immigration policy. It's a it's a public health policy. That strikes me as very similar to former DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen's insistence that that DHS didn't have a policy to separate kids from families. It's technically true, but not in implementation. In 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 the latter instance, technically there wasn't a policy to separate families, but if your policy is to prosecute all arrivals and that results in separating kids, then you have a policy that separates kids, right? It may not, you know, it's a technicality that is really kind of easy to see through. And I think the same thing goes with Title 42. Yes, it's technically a public health authority. That's what Title 42 means. It's Title 42 of the U.S. Code, which is the public health laws of the United States. And it's issued by the Centers for Disease Control. But it is being used exclusively in a migration immigration context at the border. And so it's increasingly difficult to kind of justify that you know, sort of fine tuning of a line. And you're right. A lot of people are arguing that Title 42 is illegal. Um, it's been declared illegal, at least with regard to, uh, to to families, at least once that that decision is being appealed. But I think also it's at the moment, really the only tool that the Biden administration has to regulate the number of people it admits into the country. There's been some reporting that's been unsourced that Secretary Mayorkas has argued for keeping it in place because he says that if it were to go away, then we'd see a much bigger increase in migrants at the border. And that might very well be true. I think no matter what, the administration should be planning for the end of Title 42, because I think I've said here, one way or the other, I think it's going away. I think either the courts will say it's illegal or Mexico will stop taking people back. They've already stopped taking a majority of families back. So it's usefulness as a policy is diminishing. Just today, uh, and we're recording on the 13th of October, we heard that the United States government intends to reopen the land borders to the United States and Mexico to non-essential travel by people who are vaccinated, which means that they must feel that the threat of uh, COVID from Mexico is not as big. So even the public health rationale for Title 42 is going to wane over time and is already waning. And I think these things mean that if the Biden administration is not already planning for doing something differently when Title 42 ends, ideally, if I was in administration, I would want to manage that myself. I would want to 
start putting in place alternative policies right now to deal with that so I could phase it out on my own terms rather than having an abrupt stop. But instead, what we what appears to be from the outside is that the administration is fighting tooth and nail to keep it fighting in the courts and asking Mexico to keep allowing it. Well, and right there again, you know, like MPP, you know, part of Title 42 rests with Mexico. You know, how does Mexico see us in in this light? You know, uh, is there a lot of friction between the two countries over this policy? I'd say there's a little bit of friction. I recall that Mexico agreed to MPP and Title 42 under the Trump administration, primarily under threat, uh, under threat of tariffs, uh, under threat of yanking uh, uh, cooperation in other areas. And, you know, that's not a great way to have a long term relationship with a country to our south. Biden is not seeming to want to result to those sort of strong arm tactics. We see them, at least as we just discussed, diplomatically saying, OK, Mexico, you have these other issues you want to address. We will work to address them with you. And in that context, hopefully you'll help us under my, on migration as well. But I think they're, you know, it's it's still a little bit of a tough, uh, tough road to hoe. Well, I guess we'll leave that one there and we're going to spearhead our way into this final section of the gavel. Let's talk about the new ICE enforcement memo. This week, Secretary Mayorkas ordered ICE to limit mass worksite raids where undocumented migrants are employed. The memo also orders agents to use their prosecutorial discretion to spare workers from immigration charges if, if they have been a witness or victim of workplace abuse. This is an attempt to limit wide-ranging immigration raids that resulted in the arrests and deportations of hundreds of immigrants while seemingly letting their employers off with minimal fines or penalties. So, Teresa, you know, this this sort of gets back to the softer face of DHS that Mayorkas is trying to spin here, but yet we've also just discussed MPP and Title 42 as their other hard enforcement tools. How does this memo, uh, you know, it, how is it different than the other enforcement priorities that they published in the past? And, and what does this say about the Biden administration's focus on enforcement internally? Yeah. So so here's you, you pointed out the dichotomy correctly. Increasingly, we're seeing the Biden administration use harsh tools and harsh rhetoric at the border. But internally, we, you know, in the initial days of the administration, uh, the president ordered a 100 day moratorium on deportations from people inside the country that was stopped by a federal court. Then the acting director of ICE and the, the and Secretary Mayorkas introduced uh, enforcement priorities memo that sort of redirected the ICE agents who are working in the interior away from arresting any undocumented migration they migrant they encountered to focus on threats to public safety or national security or people who had recently crossed the border. That a memo was also enjoined by the same court that put the hundred day stop on the, uh, the stop on the hundred day moratorium. So. A couple of weeks ago, Secretary Mayorkas issued a new enforcement priorities memo, uh, uh, ostensibly to sort of meet the requirements of that court, but still had the same focus. It still said, we're going to use our discretion not to arrest most run-of-the-mill undocumented immigrants who are not doing anything but being here. We're going to focus our efforts on these kind of priorities. This particular worksite enforcement memo is an adjunct to that. So one of the tools... And one of the responsibilities of ICE is to enforce uh, the provisions of law that are called employer sanctions. What this means is that since the 1986 Amnesty Act, it's illegal for an employer in the United States to knowingly employ someone who is unauthorized to work in the United States. In practice, what that meant, depending on the administration and the priorities, either ICE would go in and raid a facility where they thought there were a lot of undocumented immigrants and a roundup and arrest those undocumented immigrants and then see whether or not the, they could prove that the employer knew that they were undocumented to find them. But in the meantime, deport all the undocumented immigrants. Or under other administrations, the focus would be on going after those bad employers and building a case against the really bad employers while not like rushing in to arrest all the undocumented immigrants. 
it's basically two strategies of how to do this. On one, the penalty for undocumented employment falls on the workers. On the other, the penalty falls on the employers. From a practical standpoint for the law enforcement agencies, it is much, much harder under the law to prove that an employer knowingly employed undocumented aliens, undocumented immigrants, aliens under the statute. It's, it's a lot harder for them to make that case and prove it. And even harder to get big fines because the fines authorized under law for a lot of these big companies are not much more than a slap on the wrist. So the deterrent effect of going after companies is not that great. On the flip side, if you can disrupt a company's workforce by going after the workers, that is is seen as more of a deterrent, but the impact of that falls on the migrants. So this is really a back and forth of enforcement strategies and preferences. And, you know, what we've seen under the Obama and the Biden administration is a preference for protecting the workers and going after the employers. And under more Republican administrations, including George W. Bush and Trump, it was about going, you know, disrupting the workplace to, you know, going after the workers, disrupting the workplace to deter for, to deter other employers. So, do you think that like employers have, you know, obviously, you know, the idea of like e-verify or something that uh, yeah. always seems to be out there, but never really the uptake is never great. Plus, people find ways around it, or they're falsified, or again, as you say, being able to prove that they knew. Um, having the fact that we bounce between administrations, uh, as you mentioned going after either the employers or in the Trump administration, going after the immigrants uh, themselves, have have the both the immigrants and the employers sort of gotten to a way of like understanding this is sort of the, the waters we have to swim in and we've sort of found our way to work around it. You know, that's interesting because it's not, I don't think there's any solid evidence that either strategy has substantially diminished overall unauthorized employment in the United States. And I think that's the issue. What this memo and and the corollary memo under the Obama administration says is that it's not all about immigration enforcement. Often employers of undocumented immigrants, if they certainly if they know that their that their employees are undocumented, mm-hmm. may also be committing other labor violations. They may be withholding wages or, uh, you know, going after immigrants or threatening immigrants with deportation if they report unsafe working conditions. And I think that's the real issue that, you know, the Biden administration, the Obama administration want to see addressed. Because in their mind, those labor condition issues are a bigger priority for enforcement than the immigration law itself. And so that's what they want to target. Much like the enforcement priorities memo said, the only immigrants we really want to target for removal are those that are serious criminal offenses, serious public safety threats, serious national security threats. In this way, they're saying that we actually want to go after those employers who are bad on labor laws, who might also happen to be employing undocumented immigrants. The other thing here is that there is a a very big intersection between the Department of Labor and its enforcers, the Wage and Hour Administration or OSHA, and ICE, right? So if an employer suspects its employees are undocumented and they think that somebody is complaining to DOL about wage issues or unsafe working conditions and they threaten to call ICE or they actually do call ICE, ICE may not know that DOL is investigating them. They come in and remove the migrant who might be that witness, right? So that interferes with DOL's investigation. So this this memo was also an attempt to try to get the two the agencies to work better together, so that they might conduct joint operations. So if DOL is looking to investigate an employer for wage violations, for example, they might bring in ICE and say, "Could we make a case that they knew their employees were undocumented?" and go after it on that side. Remains to be seen how this works out. These agencies don't have a long history of cooperating very well They, uh, in terms of information sharing. There's other reasons why uh, they may not share information regularly, in part because some employers can't use ICE against them. But 
they're trying to deconflict that. Um, and definitely it's saying very clearly that for this administration, going after employers that have major labor violations uh, that affect both immigrant workers and non-immigrant workers at those work sites, that's more important than just disrupting undocumented employment. Well, and finally, just on this, just to close this out, you know, the, the administration of the previous ICE enforcement priorities memo was blocked by a uh, judge in Texas. You know, will this new enforcement priorities memo pass muster with the court? Well, this particular memo is separate from the other one, so it hasn't been sued on yet. Uh, but given the litigiousness of immigration these days, I imagine we'll be talking about a lawsuit over it in the next section of the gavel sometime soon. You know, I I would hope that the administration did look at the decision on its previous enforcement memo and try to adapt how it at least described the priorities here. You know, it, again, it remains to be seen. In this case, you know, are the states the ones to sue? What, what ground would they have? I mean, all of those things still have to be figure it out. In the meantime, this is the order for ICE and ICE will have to implement it as as written until that happens. Well, and that's going to do it for our show this week. One last reminder to subscribe, rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all the issues we discussed here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. You can follow us on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan. I'm Blake Johnson. This Week in Immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This episode was written by Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Sadiqsa Nepal, and myself. Ethan Plotkin produces and edits our show. The executive producer of BBC Podcast is Lucy Manning. See you next time on This Week in Immigration. Immigration.